1733 fleet had 21 ships. They were two days out of Havana when a bad hurricane hit them. Three ships were refloated by the salvers, and two of them are still missing. And that leaves 16 that we know about today that have all been found and plotted. The Spanish immediately instituted salvage. They sent boats up from Havana and treasure hunters have been working these wrecks ever since the Spanish left them. Shortly after Columbus's voyage of discovery, the Spanish started sending treasure fleets back to Spain. And they did that for more than 300 years. 300 years of treasure fleets going right past our little island here. And if the pirates didn't get them, sometimes the hurricanes did. There's nothing like the sound of silver. This is what it's all about. There's one thing for sure, if you don't go out and look, you'll never find it. Captain's Rules. The location of all sunken treasure is secret. Navigational coordinates will not be shared. Any clues regarding these locations are probably false. to the Elefante. The Elefante is only located four miles right off my head pin. So from my shop, knock to dive, it's about 20 minutes. It's one of the 16 ships that went down during the hurricane in 1733. We've got about three miles to go. Beautiful day today. We're extremely lucky in having that fleet right offshore. And so we're gonna go dive that and kind of show everybody what a Spanish galleon looks like after being down for almost 300 years. Hurricane got them, we tore them up, and they went right aground, they started skipping across, and this is where they broke up at. Uh, the Spanish actually came down and salvaged this fleet then, didn't they, Fizz? They certainly did. In fact, the salvage vessels came out of Havana, and they were close to home. And most of these were sticking up out of the water. It was easy to find. One of the first things they did was burn them to the water line, made the treasure more accessible. Plus, any pirates coming up and down wouldn't see them sticking out of the water. We will find something. I mean, I've never been skunked. Most of those rocks are on that side of the boat, so when you jump in, hit over that way, okay?
the main galleon of the fleet was, of course, the Capitana. But the El Infante was also one of the large galleons that carried a lot of the king's treasure. All in all, nobody knows for sure how much treasure has been produced because a lot of the treasure hunters didn't report what they were finding. And the Spanish probably were pilfering a lot of it themselves. It wasn't unusual. Harry Kenyeh happens to be the curator of the diving museum down in Isla Mirada, Florida. They've got some nice sunken treasure on display there. Carl Fismer is a living legend, in my opinion, a national treasure. He's our current generation of a legacy of treasure divers here in the Upper Keys. And he comes with just a wealth of knowledge that you're hard pressed to find anywhere else. It's an adrenaline rush, and it's just a neat thing to see in action, to see somebody that has such a command of what they're doing. And, and frankly, it's like an adult Easter egg hunt. You know, you don't know what you're going to find, and you're looking, and even if you don't find anything, it's gorgeous. area for the uh, Elefante is just a rubble area. There's not really any distinguishable features from a ship anymore, so I think that was really kind of surprising to a lot of people. We did a little metal detecting around, trying not to disturb the bottom too much, and actually found some pretty neat artifacts that we showed the guests, and they had a real good time on it. Pistol balls that were found came out of the shot locker. We found a few of them out there. It's a really neat find. A little bit of history in the palm of your hand. Brush the dirt away, and there's a musket ball sitting there. They carried bullets. They carried guns on board. They had cannons on board. A lot of people were out there trying to rob the Spanish of their gold and silver, and so and they had to protect themselves. The first thing I thought of was it was remarkable, the condition that it was in. The one that Fizz found in particular it looked like it could have been cast yesterday. The seam from the mold was still present. There was no type of contusion or modification to the orb. I would have not given it a second look, and it's Carl's keen eye that was able to identify it as being an actual artifact, to his credit. Later on, we're going to be back in the classroom and go over some of the things that we found and talk with the people about the wrecks that went down right offshore out here and do a presentation on Spanish galleons, tools that we use in trying to locate shipwrecks as well as some of the treasures that Fizz has found in the past on some wrecks. Their sailing orders were to leave Veracruz, Mexico, head east, when you hit land, turn right. This is a wreck of the El Infante, and this is about 20 years old. The way it looks today, as you have seen on a dive, the sand is just to the top of the timbers. So you got to look close, but you can see them. And some hand fanning will get you down to the bottom timbers. Spanish were meticulous records keepers. Just about everything you can imagine was written down in triplicate. So one copy would sail with the ship, one would stay in the home port, and then the third copy would sail a year later just to ensure that one of these records existed. All right, we got some brochures uh, that was made up by the state. It's on the 1733 fleet. We'll hand those out to you right now. Here you go, here you go. Congratulations. There you are. Thank you. You don't get any. I'd like to introduce Carrie Kanye from the Diving Museum in Isla Mirada. Lovely lady's a curator down there, and she brought some nice pieces, and she's going to tell us about them. We really have a wonderful collection of not only diving history here, but Upper Keys history. The plate that we see here, which is on loan to us graciously from Captain Fismer, is from the 1733 Treasure Fleet, or Plate Fleet as it's called. It goes back in the, the 1733 Plate Fleet brochure uh, that's put out by the Division the of Cultural Affairs from the state of Florida provides some historical insight into each of the individual wrecks from the 1733 fleet. I've noticed looking through this brochure that the state provides the GPS coordinates. Aren't they afraid that someone's going to go in and find treasure? 
The state has gone through and their underwater archaeology team has opened them up to the public after going through collecting, documenting, and then preserving those areas, which they've now opened up to the public. So it's pretty much been sourced out. Um, what you can see is the remnant of the footprint of the wreck, uh, and that's there for enrichment. It's the oldest artificial reef in the continental United States, a number of them actually. Kerry thought that the state didn't mind giving locations on the 1733 fleet because they'd pretty much went through and collected everything of value. And I had to open my big mouth and say, I doubt that. So there's nothing left to find? You'd be very hard pressed, I think, to find anything after the state. I'm pretty good at hard pressed. I wouldn't mind taking a shot at it. Really? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll throw down the gauntlet. I'll give you a week on the 1733 fleet to see if you can pull anything off of that that the state may have missed. My choice of Rex. Yes, sir. What's the bet? Dinner. Deal. His challenge is to endeavor to find something of particular and significant interest that still remains on these sites. Uh, he has a week to do it, and if he's successful, I will buy him dinner. I think he was pretty quick and saying he could find something out there, regardless if he wins or loses, right? He goes out to dinner with Gary, so I think that's probably a, a lot, has a lot to do with it. I'm very curious to see what he comes up with at the end of this challenge. I think we should pick where we're not going to go first, the ones that are physically impossible. The 1733 fleet has been worked since Art McKee's days. We're talking the last 40, 50 years. So if there's anything out there, it's going to be very, very hard to find, and we've got a week to do it. If there's any glory holes, they'll be in the scatter. Okay. We, we need to go south of the ballast, and we can go all the way down as far as Davis. That's about where it came over. He's asked me to help. He wants me to go out there and pull out all the stops and use my dive boats and any other vessels to get out there. So, of course, he's my partner. I'll do what I can. He's asked me to do this as a favor for him, and by all means, he'd do the same for me. And the secret is getting in the scatter, and that will be our secret. I don't like educating too many people. Okay. So we'll try around the uh, scatter then of the Elefante. What's next? Yeah, well, Capitan is buried. We tried that. God knows how much sand is on top of it. However, on the scatter of the Capitana, going westerly, about two miles, there's a place Art McKee told me about 35 years ago. It's called the Black Ledge. And Art picked up coins on that. After the Capitana, where do you want to go? Well, I hope we don't have to go anywhere, but it's good to have another plan. Um, San Jose is out. That's buried worse than the Capitana. The Herrera, the Tres Pontes? My money would be on the Trace. Last time I was on that, it was rocky, reefy, sandy patches, but not deep sand. Herrera is in a big pile of sand. But that gives us three spots. Infani scatter, black ledge from the Capitana, and if those fall on their butt, we'll go to the trace. I think we got a heck of a chance, especially in that Infani scatter. You keep saying we. I mean, this is your bet, not mine. You're the one that's going to pay. I'm not going to pay. Can you loan me some money? I'm not going to loan you any money either. we got to find this thing. we got to find this and do it pretty quick. Let's go do it. The main galleon of the fleet was, of course, the Capitana. But the El Infante was also one of the large galleons that carried a lot of the king's treasure. It was named after the infant, Jesus. Every treasure hunter in the world has been diving on it at one time or another. And in my humble opinion, the best place to find something good, that is, a glory hole maybe, is in the scatter. Run the ballast, go south a couple of hundred yards, and that's what we'll try. When you get on the main site, you have to work south or work to the west. That's the two scatter areas. I did pretty good on that wreck back in the 70s and early 80s. I don't believe any wreck will ever be picked clean. I like the looks of this. It's that rocky, reefy, sandy bottom.
about a little over 100 yards off the main ballast on the Infante. The range markers, when you look down to the south, is Davis and Alligator. And once you line those up, there's only one crossing you can make come in this direction. That's right over top of the ballast. The Infante came over down near Davis, bumped all along the bottom in here. The bulk of the Spanish treasure was in silver, and it wouldn't have been unusual for a big galleon to be carrying anywhere three, four, five hundred thousand pesos. And I'm sure there's still a lot of them out there. Probably your best bet, like I've said before, is looking in the scatter rather than right on the main sites, because it's true, everybody has picked over the main wreck areas, including the state and the park people. What's unique about this fleet is, it was the first time they tried and experimented with the milled edge coins, like the pillar dollars. 1732 and 1733 dates are the rare ones. I've been lucky enough to find some of them out here. And nobody really knows how many of the modern day guys have got. The pillar dollar could actually be called a commemorative piece. It had two pillars on the front which commemorated the Pillars of Hercules, which was the Straits of Gibraltar. And they used to believe if you sailed out past those, you'd fall off the edge of the world. But Columbus went out and came back, and they altered that to just plain plus ultra, meaning more beyond. And that's what the 1732 and 33 pillar dollars commemorated. Beautiful coin, one of the prettiest coins ever made, actually. I should say that also there were experimental coins on board called ricotados a cob-shaped coin that was hand cut and hand weighed, but not stamped. They threw them in the screw presses, and those are very rare pieces. D.L. Cheney and I found a fair amount of them, uh, I think it was in 1981, out here on the El Infante. I like thinking about stuff like that. This is one of the coins D.L. Cheney and I recovered. It has a wonderful date on it, four digits, 1733. It was made in Mexico City, and of course the king was King Philip V. When Gary and I dove the Infante, we actually didn't get on the main section because, as I've been saying forever, your chances of finding something good's in the scatter. Well, we got in the scatter, and we found a lot of old fishing weights, some fish hooks, still had the monofilament line on them, a couple of pieces of a copper sheeting, didn't amount to much. Anyhow, at least with the lead fishing weights in the monofilament, we got that out of the water. Lead is also toxic to the marine environment, and monofilament fish lines are really bad on sea turtles. That's really it, nothing much. No treasure, no gold or silver. Well, I've had worse days, Chief, but I'm gonna tell you this, Sinkers and fish hooks ain't gonna pay the dinner bill. There was a Capitana in every Spanish fleet. So for over 300 years of sailing the treasure fleets, the main ship, the leader, the boss, as it were, would be the Capitana. And it was the Capitana's job to lead the way and all the other ships would be following behind him. The Black Ledge was a site that happens to be in the scatter of the Capitana. But basically what it is, if you're on the main ballast of the Capitana and you're looking to the west, mile and a half, two miles, it was actually grass that was sticking up and it looked black in color. The thing to do is run to that and get back off of it a little ways in the sand and then metal detect in there. First time I was on that, I start metal detecting, I get a hit, I hand fan a little bit, and there's a little yellowish looking thing standing on edge. And I thought, a gold coin. It was a quarter, one of those clad quarters. I, I don't know how somebody had lost it there, but they sure did. Uh, 
I think the Capitan of the 1733 fleet was manifested to have about a half a million pesos. Most of the time, there would be more than what was manifested being smuggled. So when that ship was salvaged, they salvaged more than the original 500,000. In other words, the king made money on that wreck. I'm not certain as to how many people were lost, but I know that the only person that died on the Capitana, which was the leader of the fleet, was the captain himself. And it was just as well because after the king realized he got more money back in salvage than he had manifested on the ship, uh, he probably would have cut the captain's head off anyway. I found coins before between here and the Capitana. So there is good stuff in the scatter. It's just we didn't get any today. All right, well, day one's gone. It's OK. We got five left. And you know, I've had worse days than this. I've had many days in a row where the metal detector needle didn't even move. Well, I'm going to tell you, if you have uh, five more days like that, you're going to be paying the bill at dinner. How come you're so optimistic? I'm just trying to get you get you no, motivated. No, you're hoping. You're deep down. You're hoping I lose, aren't you? No, I'd like to see you win. I but will. I will. But it's going to be tough. It's a man's job. Let's yeah, go. We can only find one. Yeah, to do it. He, there was one around here somewhere. All right, five more days. Coming up, Fizz and I are out to find treasure on a fleet that's been salvaged for over 200 years. Treasure Divers continues next with the 1733 Challenge. So Kerry's challenge to Fizz was to find something on the 1733 fleet. She indicated that the state had been working it pretty heavily and had probably gotten everything off of it. I'm pretty good at hard pressed. Dinner. Deal. <laughs> Fizz being the individual and tenacious as he is, and also probably wanting to go out to dinner, uh, took that challenge from Kerry. It's going to be funny to see if he can actually pull this thing off. I mean, that'd be great. But if he uh, doesn't pull it off, it's going to be a little probably embarrassing to him. So we'll just have to wait and see. I'm writing to a friend of mine. His name is Carl Clausen. Carl was the underwater archaeologist for the state of Florida. In fact, he was the first one. Carl's also an expert on every fleet here in Florida, 1715, 1733, 1622. And unfortunately, he ran afoul of the law, and he's now serving a rather long sentence in the Zephyr Hills Correctional Institute. Some people might think it a little extreme to visit a friend in prison just to help me win a bet. That's not quite the only reason. It boosts his morale at the same time. Plus, he knows more than just about everybody else. So hopefully in the next few days, I'll be up there talking with Carl. Yeah, looks like we got blue water right back over there about 200 yards. So Fizz got me involved with this bet of his and Carrie's. Yeah to go out and dive the 1733 fleet during one of the busiest times of my season, my dive season, uh, right in the middle of summer. One day we were out in the area of where the uh, San Pedro went down. The Florida Keys Marine Sanctuary has actually recreated what it may look like back whenever it went down. I didn't expect to find anything out there, but I did want to take a look. 
the big ballast mound was still intact and some of the cannons laying off to the side there, which would be kind of indicative of what a Spanish galleon would look like after it wrecked. You know, at least we could cross that, that one off the list and say we'd been there and taken a look. What'd they make that black ink out of? Wasn't indigo, was it? To help oh, us choose our next yeah, dive, yeah. Fizz checks in with fellow historian and treasure diver, Jack Haskins. Jack Haskins is the number one man in this business today. Jack is a researcher, for starters, and he can translate archaic Spanish. And Jack is responsible through his research for more Spanish treasure being recovered than anyone else. As a matter of fact, one time Jack had five old Spanish maps for when they were salvaging the 1733 fleet. He compared them to today's modern charts, and he figured out where the wreck of the Angustius was. So he took his boat there, jumped in the water, and in 45 minutes, he located the Angustius, one of the Spanish galleons of the 1733 fleet. Jack also recovered one of the rarest gold coins in the world off of that same wreck. It was a four escudo, King Philip V, portrait coin dated 1732, and that was the first year portrait gold coins were made. Extremely rare piece. Craig Keyrack. I right. always call on it's him, especially when I'm in a bind, and I'm pretty much up against the wall on this bet with Carrie. So in. I had to get his opinion on where the best places would be on the 1733 okay. fleet. If you had to pick one of the 1733 wrecks to find some treasure on, what one would you pick? That's a good question. <laughs> but the one I'd pick hasn't been found yet. But I hope to be the one that finds it. There's two missing galleons, and one of them should be quite rich. <laughs> and of course, his first answer was, well, the best place to get coins on a 1733 galleon would be one of the ones that isn't found yet. I guess that's his way of trying to poke fun at me for getting into a bet like this. What's your number two choice? <laughs> Jack's well, second choice the of the 1733 Francisco. fleet Hard was the wreck of the San Francisco. Ballast pile is pretty much intact, and it's a beautiful dive, but there has to be coins around that thing. We've got excellent weather today, so we're going to go dive the San Francisco and see what's down there. Jack Haskins gave us some information of one of the best places he felt for anything that may have been left out there was the San Francisco. Gary and I went out and we dove the San Francisco. It's a beautiful wreck. That was a treat for me. I'd never been on that wreck before. And it was uh, remarkably in pretty good shape as far as the ballast mound goes. It's only sitting in about eight or 10 feet of water, so the whole dive was extremely shallow. Ballast stones were used as a counterweight to stabilize the sailing ships. These stones have metallic properties from the way they were formed. Of course, your metal detectors don't do good on the ballast pile. The rocks are hot, and they'll set your machines off. So we got out towards shore. That's the best way to go. And we got a lot of hits. We have got a lot of hits that were out in the area towards shore. One of them that we got was a little sliver. I mean, just we're talking just a real tiny bit of what appeared to be silver small oxidized piece. I believe it used to be a coin, but in salt water, the silver will, over the years, oxidize down to nothing and then disappear. This one was well on its way to disappearing. So, wasn't enough to win the bet with. of lead down in the cracks and crevices of that wreck and it was melted lead. You could tell that it would have been in a fire 
and all this lead had actually been melted and gone down to the bottom. When the Spanish first got there to salvage them, they burned the wrecks to the water line. That served two purposes. It took them off the horizon for any enemy ships to see them, and it made getting into the cargo holds a lot easier. That's where the bulk of the silver was stored. It helped in the ballast of the boat. Found a little bit down there. Damn, I had my cell phone in my pocket. That's what I was hearing ringing. Yeah. A lot of iron on the wreck, a lot of lead on the wreck. Uh, and then one little piece of silver we found. That's pretty neat. You know, I think that in itself could probably win. Maybe it could win Carrie's bet. It may, it's debatable, but I'm not gonna claim that. It it wasn't really enough. One sliver of a coin, no. I'm going to either win it big, or I'm going to win it big. That's it. So tell me how you really feel. I feel like I'm going to win it big. We should maybe go up and talk to Bob Weller. He was on here like shortly after the Spanish crashed. Is that old? That's how long he's been around. The Bob it was actually here before Jack got here. And he's still got a lot of wonderful 1733 material. A lot of really nice artifacts. We found a lot of stuff. I've had a lot worse days than what we did right here. A lot worse. Well, you better do a lot better than what you have been doing, or else you're going to be winding up buying dinner. I'm working on it. I hope you can pull a rabbit out of your hat. I'm glad you said hat. Gold chain was all in a ball. Next, treasure diving legend Bob Frogfoot Weller shares rare artifacts from his personal collection and sends us off to dive more of the sunken fleet. Treasure Divers continues with the 1733 challenge. For the past few days, I've been helping Fizz win a bet and find treasure on the 1733 fleet, but to no avail. The time has come to call on a higher power for help with a visit to a man we call Frogfoot. Bob Frogfoot Weller. He's probably one of the most famous treasure hunters besides Fizz and Jack Haskins that are still alive today. 
Hey, that's Cam's girl from Santa. You better just knock me out. I can't. Welcome to Bob and Margaret's Treasure Museum. <laughs> Holy cow. I'm here about the 1733 fleet, but I know those weren't on it. No, that's about 8 BC. Bob was oh, one of the you. first treasure hunters in the Keys. God, I don't know how many years ago, but he's been at it a lot longer than I have. Exactly. And he Gosh. certainly is more knowledgeable about these here. shipwrecks than I am. That, that dagger's a neat dad. Let me show you that a little closer. See if it still works. Stick it in hell. <laughs> Stick it in the car. <laughs> I get the point. I was a cop in a bar. Yeah. Bob's also bar. written several books on yeah. shipwrecks around Florida and even some that's not in Florida. You have a lot of artifacts from the 1733 fleet. That's mm -hmm. kind of like what I was hoping to pick your brain about today. That's a beautiful painting, by the way. And uh, I wasn't aware that you got that big platter off the Infante. Yeah. yeah. That's the kind of material we're looking for. And uh, I'm backed into this bet, and I need to find something treasure-wise to win dinner. You want to loan him that plate? No, not today. All right. <laughs> I don't think you want to eat off that anyway. <laughs> Well, it's just too bad that they didn't have the GPS numbers back in those days. It would have made it a little easier. Yeah. Well, then they probably picked it all clean. Thank you for that input. I'll give you $100 for Oh, it. that's a great price. <laughs> that's a 1693 coin. Just goes to show you, how the older they are, the more valuable they become. That's like what old I'm, wine. That's what I've been telling everybody. The yeah. older we become, the more yeah. valuable that's we right. are. That's right. The Spanish salvaged most everything on board. Bob knows all the secrets of the 1733 fleet, including the smugglers' clever tricks to get around the king's royal fifth. On the San Jose, the manifest only listed 30,000 pesos, but they found 180,000. The merchants that had smuggled it on board, and they think the captain was involved too. We later found silver screws screwed into the woodwork and painted over, and when the customs people would go ashore, they were unscrewing. Each screw was one ounce, one ounce of silver, which is a month's pay for a sailor. Silver screws. Now, you think the smugglers today are smart. I'd have never thought of something like that. And they didn't tax jewelry. So a lot of the people in 1733 also made jewelry out of the gold and silver. Gold chains. I have a heavy gold, gold chain, gold for example. Chain. And gold rings. I have a lot of gold rings and, and gold toothpicks and things like that the king never taxed, so they got past customs. And that's Margaret's favorite, it's a beautiful ring. The gold toothpicks, high-ranking officers would normally wear these on a chain around their neck, had a toothpick on one end and a, an earwax spoon on the other, or a Coke spoon, because in 1715 they had Coke. For me, it was not only great to go up and visit Bob and see all the treasures that he had, and learn a little bit more about the 1733 fleet. But it was great to hear Bob speak about his adventures and where he thought some of the treasures may still lie. The West Indies, you don't have the sailing routes on there. Yes, they are. are they? They're there, yep. There. Oh, yes. The trade route. That's the way the old Spanish treasure fleet went. That map was a 1740 map made primarily after the treasure fleet routes were established. And you better stay on that fleet route because if you hit a reef and you were off the route, the king would have your head. He said, I gave you a map to come back to Spain with, better use it. <laughs> What do you think about it? You think there's anything left out there on the 1733? Oh, yeah. I've been saying the scatter is the best place oh, to yeah. look. Absolutely. When we worked the 1733 fleet, we thought everything was in the ballast pile. You worked the ballast pile and when right you finished that, you were done. Nothing could be further from the truth. <laughs> the 1733 fleet, the scatter pile in most cases has never been touched. I got involved in this wager and I've always felt like the scatters are the best place to look. Us. You know, everybody in the business has been on them ballast mounds at some time or another. And I'm thinking Capitana and the Trace, if you had to go in there and find something, where would you look? Oh, that's easy. The important thing is this, that when the Capitana sank, the top decks were still out of water, 
And, and over the years, the hurricanes and winds and that would carry this stuff into what they call a scatter pattern. There's still five boxes of the silver pieces of aid missing from the Capitan, each one carrying 3,000 pieces of aid. And that would have gone right down to hard bottom. And there will always be more left, more to find. Never find it. I'm all. a firm believer in that. Actually, I feel so lucky today, I'm trying to decide which restaurant we should go to. And I know it's going to be one of those ones I've never been to before. Yeah, right. After we visited with Bob for an afternoon, he gave us some great information of where we should go look on the 1733 fleet. One of the wrecks he talked about, and we actually went out and dove, was the Capitana. I feel pretty lucky today. This is the area where Jack got that Capitana medallion, the religious gold piece, appraised at $250,000 by Dr. Mendel Peterson of the Smithsonian. And it's right in this same area. So who knows, maybe there's another one for me. found some rocks, ballast stone, a lot of sandy area. That whole area has looked like it worked a lot. And we did get a hit out there, and we did find a metal pen, an iron pen. That was a neat find. At first, whenever I uncovered that a little bit, it, I thought it was silver. It was shiny so much. You think of iron as being rusty brown metal. Well, this wasn't. This was shiny silver. And my first thought, he struck the mother load that here was a piece of silver, but uh, it wasn't. It was just a, an iron pen. Eh, 18 inches long. It was square and looked like it had been violently ripped off the ship. In other words, it was bent a little bit and you can see where it was cracked. Next, we splash the site of the Trace Puentes, another favorite of Frogfoot and Fizz. So the Tres Puentes was a really interesting wreck. We did find ballast stone down there. We actually found part of the ship. One of the ribbing sections to it, a wooden rib was still exposed. That's pretty neat. The sanctuary has a law that you cannot remove anything off the bottom. If it was in the sandy area, we'd remove some of the sand so we'd get a picture of it. The shipwrecks of the 1733, one by one, were crossing them off the list. Since the Chavez sits just offshore in about seven feet of water, I'll let Fizz handle that one on his own. I loaded up the dinghy with some scuba gear, and the Chavez is the easiest, closest one to get to when you got a little boat. Years ago, I built the Chavez many times, and it was a small ship, but a nice ballast mound out in the middle of a sand patch with grass around it. So I got out there this time, and unfortunately, the sand is in, and it's got the rocks covered up. But that's the way it is in his business. You know, you have more bad days than you have good ones. Over the years, there have been some really wonderful artifacts recovered there. I got a few coins on it back in the early 80s, and I found a large piece of pottery. It's about yay big, and it's thick. I keep this in my garage, and I want to show it to you, but don't look at all the other junk, okay? Just the big jug. An Alibaba jar. And that was the largest jug carried on the Spanish galleons. They would use to transport wine in it, you know, so they'd always have something to drink. However, if a high-ranking official died during the trip, they'd put him down in here and pickle him 
for the trip back to Spain so he could be buried properly. If some common crewman like Gary fell over dead on the boat, well, we would just throw him right over the side. This was for wine to drink, and if some important person died, like myself, I'd be interned in the wine and sent back to Spain. The Spanish would set up salvage camps, usually on some of the small islands nearby the wrecks. That way they'd have a base to put all the treasure they were recovering. This is the home of Jerry Wilkinson. Jerry's kind of a one-man clearing house for Florida Keys historical information. Well, Jerry, I got into a bit of a situation making this bet for dinner, and I need to know a lot of 1733 information. So do you have any idea where the Spanish salvage camps were? I hear rumors. And I'm glad you used the word rumors, because that's all I have also. But we do have a map, you know, where the wrecks were, and we can make some assumptions uh, just by the fact that they didn't have motorboats to run in, that they probably camped very nearby where they could sail or row their boats from the wrecks. And the numbers that's on the index would be the numbers that are seen beside where each of these shipwrecks and here's the line of keys, the little circles and so forth, and the numbers are off to the right and where each ship had sunk. Number five, that's the Capitana. And six is the Chavez right down there. Right below it. Yeah, that's true. Anyway, uh, Jack had reason to believe that one of the salvage camps would be where Whale Harbor Resort is today. And that would be relatively close. Uh, what would be in there? The Chavez is close, Tres Puentes and the Herrera. It'd be a good location. And it, even today, it's real breezy blowing through there. I mean, even though it, it isn't an out island, that might have been a good place to set it up. Well, it would be because, you know, Whale Harbor would be, be right in this area in here somewhere, and the wrecks were lined up offshore some three or four miles. Right. Do you know how long it took the Spanish to complete their salvage operation? I think it started in 1733, and it's still going. It's ongoing today. So, as a matter of fact, your recent little excursion looking for treasure uh, proves it. And why not, you know? We have a real treasure, something that's one of a kind. It's a piece of history. Many times you can go back to these salvage camps today, metal detect around and find some coins that were lost. I did that down in Ecuador once on that Chandui Capitana wreck. We found the base camp, and darn if we didn't get more coins there than we did in the water diving. I like to poke along the shorelines just because the scatter runs to the west from where the galleons are sunk. I got over by the high school there on Plantation Key and rummaged around in the tree lines, in the tree roots, there was a couple of timbers from the Capitan, a big one stuck in the tree roots, and also a couple of the large balls of wax. They had beeswax, and they were taking it back to Spain to make candles out of it. And there it was, stuck in the tree roots since 1733. What are you trying to find? Coins. Coins? Have you find found any? Over the years, yeah, thousands, thousands of them. Anything cool today? No, not yet, but I'm working. Well, the best piece today is this piece of pottery, and my feeling is we might trade it for a couple of French fries. But, Carrie, if you're watching this, I'm not giving up. I'm going to win that bet. I still got some time left. A week of searching for treasure on the 1733 hasn't turned up a winner yet. Next, we get a big surprise on our last ditch effort to win this crazy bet.
Well, for the 1733 fleet, I have contacted everybody I know that is knowledgeable about the fleet, historians, archaeologists. I've even contacted Carl Clausen, who I haven't heard back from him yet. Meanwhile, I'm not opposed to trying just about anything. Hi, you Kit Kat. We're running out of time, and I thought, why don't we try this psychic up on Key Largo? I made a bet some time ago, and now it's down to the last day. Um, you need my help. Yes, I do. I use psychometry, so if oh, I can yeah. have something oh, of yours. Sure. Here you go. This is regarding treasure? Yes, it is. OK. Well, the information that I'm getting is that uh, about three minutes to 12 tonight, Midnight, three minutes to midnight. Three minutes to midnight. You have to contemplate this problem, and by midnight, you will be enlightened. About three minutes to midnight, contemplate on the problem. Exactly. And by midnight, yes. enlightenment. That's cutting it close, but it could save me. We will be enlightened with this information. Yes. Yes, this is going to work just fine. I got that feeling now. I got it. I'm going to I'm going to win this. I am going to win this. So in the last hour of the last day of Fizz's bet with Kiri, here we are on the reef near the 1733 shipwreck San Jose, searching for treasure at night. And at the stroke of midnight, check it out, the stroke of midnight, you're going to find enlightenment. Now what exactly that meant was, I'm not sure, but enlightenment I did find. There was this Buddha, I know, that sounds strange, diving at midnight, there's this Buddha, and I thought, well, this has to be it. I found him right at the stroke of midnight, I'm taking him back to shore. He tries to bring up a Buddha. Now, there's this Buddha that's been sitting down there for many, many years. Everybody knows the site. This is probably the sixth Buddha out there. People have been stealing uh, that Buddha out there for years. And that's when Gary started saying, no, 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 Buddha has to stay out here. And I said, no, 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 Buddha has to go back because I'm enlightened. Long story short, Gary won the battle and Buddha's still out there underwater. And so I'm going to have to face the music I'm going to have to take Carrie to dinner. I'm going to have to pick up the check and pay for it like a man. A win, lose, or draw, it's been a pleasure. Likewise. I dropped Fizz off tonight at the restaurant. I mean, he had lost the bet, or I think he lost the bet, because when he got out of the truck, he handed me this and asked me to hang on to it for him. And I'm not sure where this came from. Um, at least I thought he lost the bet. So are you wondering who's going to pick up the check tonight? Well, you know, as a matter of fact, I am kind of wondering. You know, a treasure hunter always keeps his secrets. However, I'm not going to let a young lady pay for my dinner. So I've decided I'm going to pick up the tab tonight. And we'll just see who wins or loses. Regardless of the outcome, I think that we have recovered a treasure, and that treasure is actually Carl. And I was supposed to find enlightenment. Enlightenment? With the breadth of knowledge that he has on history and his love of history and his ability to disseminate that history. It's better than a treasure. It's better than a coin. It's history. Oh. This was a perfect evening. Perfect. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to make another bet next week. And 
at the stroke of 12. I would be enlightened. I was going to say that. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were searching for it. Searching for the word. No, no, that's okay. I wasn't. I was building up to it. Uh, yeah, all right. I'm sorry. That's, that's okay. I, I'm a pro. Yeah.